A very good evening to all distinguished panelists and participants. Bharti Vidya Peet Institute of Computer Applications and Management, BVI CAM, in association with Computer Science Chapter of IEEE Delhi Section, Consultants Network Affinity, CNA Group of IEEE Delhi Section, Life Member Affinity, LMA Group of IEEE Delhi Section, Inter-Society Relations Standing Committee of IEEE Delhi Section, Industrial Relations and Site Standing Committees of IEEE Delhi Section, with the associations of CSI, SAFA Society, IST Delhi Section, and IT Delhi Center, welcomes you all to this webinar on National Education Policy, NEP 2020. Dr. Kalam used to say, the purpose of education is to make good human beings with skill and expertise. Enlightened human beings can be created by teachers. Changes in the education policy is a major way to provide the nation better students, professionals, and better human beings. The above quote reflects the current scenario for our country like India. Our 34 year old national policy on education was long looking for a transformation as somewhere our young minds were lacking the holistic development and training required to transform them into holistic, self-reliant, flexible individuals rather than the conventional nine to five workers that we were churning out. The National Education Policy 2020 is a milestone document in the context of nation building, which is expected to overhaul the entire academic system in the country from pre-primary to tertiary level. The policy has introduced new subjects, yet reduced the load of the curriculum on the students. The evaluation and assessments have also been performed, which will certainly eliminate examination phobia from the students. NEP 2020 is primarily based on multidisciplinarity of education through which every child will be allowed to do what he loves to do as an important step towards nation building. NEP 2020 is a forward-looking proactive policy having all-round inbuilt flexibility for all the stakeholders especially like getting degree at fast track, modular entry and exit, having subjects of their choice, student mobility from one institution to other, in between the program, by having academic bank of credits, getting fast track promotion, centralized research funding, graded autonomy to the colleges, etc. This webinar today is aimed to discuss all these issues in detail. I will first take this opportunity today to welcome amongst us our distinguished galaxy of palanists for the day. We are privileged to have amongst us a galaxy of ex ex experts. I will first welcome Professor Subruta Mukhopadhyay, Chairperson, Consultants Network Affinity CNA Group and former Chairperson of IEEE Delhi Section. Uh, I also welcome amongst us Sri R.K. Vyas, President, Computer Society of India. I now request Professor Subrata Mukhopadhyay to commence today's session with his welcome address. Over to you. It is rather a very good contemporary subject on which we will be dealing. Unfortunately, I will not be attending the entire session because I have got a, already a parallel meeting going on. But definitely, Ritika has covered the gleams and essence of the entire new education policy, which is coming in vogue after almost 34 years of being the old one being there. So whenever some new thing comes, everybody has gotten a lot of expectation. And it has been with a lot of flexibilities, as she told also, and we'll be definitely hearing from the speakers. But the only condition is so many issues are there. These countries we quite vast. Multilingual, multicultural, multi ethnic, everything multi, multiplexing, just as uh, Professor Hoda was speaking about these meetings, same thing, so many multis are there. 
so we have to live with and above all with the constitution itself it is a concurrent in list just like my own sector power sector so where states have to ultimately implement most of them center maybe i mean what should i say supporting in this activity is not by policy even central institutions are also there but how long and how far it will be possible to execute that has to be seen because there are a lot of issues in this one it is not so easy to implement better say, tomorrow we say modular course today itself we know it if somebody has passed some degree with a correspondence course we take him as a second class teacher or something we do not admit him to the teaching community so easily only if we do not get then only so we have to see actually the level and all this thing ultimately any way it is a very good effort to take the country in a progressive manner ultimately that should be implemented and that let us hear from the speaker itself over to dr kritika kritika oshan thank you so much sir your presence has always been motivation to us to continue with the good work uh i now request shri rk vyas president computer society of india to motivate us with his words uh, over to you vyas sir thank you ritika good evening everybody i am really delighted to be a part of this uh, panel where we will be discussing the future of indian education the national education policy 2020 basically many things has been listed in the national education policy and i hope the multidisciplinary aspect the skill development aspects and the examination except accepts uh, concepts which has been introduced in the national education policy 2020 and build your own self that is one of the nature which is being given to students and also some cushion has been given to the faculty members then the persons who are really interested in their own subjects by a person who is interested in arts he can also talk about biology when he is interested in political science he can talk about mathematics also so these type of things modularity which has been given uh, as spelled in the national education policy ritika has already explained many more things and dr subrata mukherji has added to it obviously the implementation in most of the see whenever we make a policy obviously implementation in our country is a great uh, problem and i hope when the states and the other persons stakeholders who are will be involved in these education activities they will really appreciate how the country has really taken care of all aspects of the development from z- uh, zeroth age to the uppermost age and the exit patterns at different age has been given in national education policy which is really very good so if you, if i am not interested after first year of a course in a graduation i can easily exit out of it and if i am interested and i feel after 5 years i feel no i should have completed my graduation for my future so i could have done, i will be doing that so these kind of things which were not available and people were really stuck you know after 2 years of graduation work and if i have got certain exigency emergency or something i leave my course then i do not get the graduate degree i start from first year again so these kind of things which has been developed and moreover when it computer science learning machine learning and various more things has been introduced at various levels for each and every category of the student obviously being in a concurrent list we will be facing lot of problems at the time of implementation but i hope the guidelines which is being given by the central government and that will be really taken care by the state governments also at various stages and more and more we'll be hearing from more about this national education policy from our eminent speaker dr pankaja mittal who has been in this education arena as a vice chancellor of one of the very good university bps mahila university i had an opportunity to visit this university a number of times as an examiner and i have met her also mm-hmm. once or twice uh, long back uh, she may not remember those days because it was a very quick visit just say namaste namaste and uh, you know, <laughs> because vice chancellors are always busy you know and then as a ugc secretary general and now as a uh, in association of indian university she had a wide experience of education sector and implementation of various kind of educational activities at various places so i hope she will be giving us a very good insight of the national education policy 2020 
and we all students faculty members and all the participants of this webinar will be really benefited with this i on behalf of computer society of india i must thank you all that i have been given this opportunity and the members of the computer society of india across the country where we have got around around 60 chapters and 800 institutional branches all over the country they will be and many of them you know professor huda who is really pioneer in connecting the people all over the country not only all over the country but all over the world in the last webinar we were connected by 21 countries you know so so he has really made this virtual platform as a place where we get together every week and share the best of the things which has already happened and which in future will be implementing. With these words, I must thank to the management of Bharti Vidya Peet and all fellow societies who are being engaged in these activities of promoting the education, in, in latest education, in various aspects of the life. Uh, over to Dr. Nitika. Thank you, Madam Pankaja Mittal, for accepting the offer of all the societies and Bharti Vidya Peet for giving us this lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, sir. I now request Professor M. N. Hood, sir, Director of Bharti Vidya Peets Institute of Computer Applications and Management, BVI CAM, to address the participants with his inspiring words. Good evening to everyone. At the outset, let me take this opportunity to welcome honorable speaker for today, none other than Dr. Pankaj Mittal. I take this opportunity to thank her and I am grateful that despite so much of busy and preoccupied schedule, she never says no to me. Today also she was back to back engaged and just around up two, three minutes before five, before six, she has logged out from one of the meeting and then joined our meeting. Thank you so much, madam. I also take this opportunity to welcome my uh, all the friends from different professional societies, Professor Subrata Mukhapadhyay, the former chairperson of IEEE Delhi section, the present chairperson of IEEE Consultant Network Affinity Group, Professor Subramaniam Krishnamurthy, the former chairperson of IEEE Delhi section, Professor R. K. Vyas, National President of the Society of India, my own very dear friend, uh, Professor A. K. Saini, the vice president of both the societies, Computer Society of India, as well as the Institution of Electronics and Telecom Engineers, and the Dean University School of Management Studies, and the Director IQAC of Grove in the first university. All other friends from different professional societies, my friend uh, Mr. Bhatia from IET, National Governing Council member, and so much of senior people amongst the audience, I can't name them. I have, uh, I have uh, General Chandele here. I have uh, so many, uh, uh, my apologies for not naming you. Thank you so much for joining this program. Mr. Vyas was talking about connecting people today. Around 400 plus people from 84 different universities of the country are joining for this program. And the discussion or deliberation which we are going to have at least will clear the doubt and make them more empowered what is added in this policy, National Education Policy 2020. Uh, at least to these 84 universities and I will request all of them to take away and percolate this to rest of your friends across the country. My dear friends, the topic chosen today is almost under hot debate since last one month. Since then, the uh, policy was announced by the ministry and Honorable Prime Minister himself uh, took that lead to uh, brief about the policy. The National Education Policy 2020, Dr. Vitika has already given the gist of the agenda, which will be discussed today, and the brief uh, uh, of what the policy has enumerated and the brief takeaway for everyone in the policy. What I look at the policy is, is this, this particular policy is a long awaited policy which has been declared after a gap of 34 years and is based on access, equity, quality, affordability, and lastly, of course, accountability. And that all should be our objective as well. That how are we going to address these issues? Access, equity, quality, affordability, and accountability. I personally feel that there could not have been a better policy than this, which could have been so forward looking, proactive, innovative, and that too at the moment is student centered and taking care of all stakeholders. 
that is how i say that this is one of such policy which made students also king which made teachers also king and not only that which also made the management of the institutions also king let's see uh, uh, for this uh, particular topic i have invited none other than dr pankaj mittal who has a very wide experience her biota will formally be read by dr uh, ritika the coordinator of the webinar but uh, let me give you an idea a huge service with university grants commission and former assistant secretary university grants commission then two terms with uh, uh, bhagat pool singh mahila vishwavidyalaya as the vice chancellor of the university so flavor uh, uh, from admin end uh, of a uh, controlling agency a statutory agency to the end of the vice chancellor implementation uh, within the university and that to a university where the maximum possible challenge used to come because the students used to come from villages and when your students a spread of the students are coming from, from villages uh, introducing any innovative scheme it becomes a, initially a matter of challenge but once you implement it becomes a matter of success and achievement so i have invited dr pankaj amitra having all this experience and nowadays she is the secretary general of association of indian universities of the topic so we will not speak would like to hear more from ma'am but this policy implemented its letter and spread let me tell you again is going to be so useful that the people who are who, who are so called uh, outside the mainstream will also get connected with the mainstream that kind of duty this policy has got so thank you so much for uh, joining this webinar those who are on youtube my request to all of you if you want certificate please join at webex because we will we won't be in a position to issue you certificate on youtube and uh, on uh, uh, this uh, uh, policy i have uh, uh, customized my own share that this this entire philosophy which we are going to inculcate through this particular policy is basically that mera yahi hai junoon mera yahi hai shauk mera yahi hai junoon mera yahi hai shauk mera chalaa wahan chala de jahan ho andhera and the kind of the challenges which pol policy is put forward before all of us all teachers all universities across the country is basically to believe in that particular philosophy that oh nayi education policy ke musafir tumhe abhi bahut dur jana hai oh nayi education policy ke musafir tumhe abhi bahut dur jana hai patthron pe gulab khilana hai aur aandhiyon mein chirag jalana hai possibly everything which we teachers used to see used to realize is impossible now is going to become the possible with the help of the new education policy that kind of proactive that kind of positive that kind of forward looking policy it is so thank you so much just to those participants who are new to our webinar for them the process of certification is that at the end of the webinar we will be sharing a feedback link and all of you will be required to fill up the feedback link and the data filled up in the feedback link will be captured by auto generate auto certificate generation system which we have configured using google api so based on the data uh, submitted in the feedback form the software will capture that data will generate a certificate will uh, create its pdf will attach in a mail and will send mail and the certificate should be delivered within 30 minutes maybe within 3 4 minutes but if there is some delay on the google server maximum around 15 20 or 30 minutes at your mail id as an attachment if you receive certificate then uh, if you do not receive certificate within 30 minutes we will be also sharing a google drive link where you can click refresh it check your certificate in alphabetical manner please understand those who will be here in the webex room this webex room after 7:30 will be converted into a call center to resolve your queries for the purpose of certificate but if you contact us on any other medium like whatsapp like email the way you keep on contacting sorry we would be in a position to help you out there because our certificate generation system is completely automated system we can look into your queries and see to it that where system is malfunctioning but we can't help you outside the system if you do not fill up the feedback form so be attentive see to it that when we post the feedback link feedback link will be posted right in the chat window so be attentive the moment it is pasted copy the link from there and then you can fill up the feedback form for the purpose of getting certificate once you get certificate write in the chat window thank you so much and then depart for with a commitment to join the next webinar four other webinars in the sequence every uh, saturday or friday evening 
these free evening webinars have already been announced. The registrations are open. You can register for those webinars and attend that. Thank you so much to uh, all of you. And uh, with this note, uh, I would like to conclude and hand over to Dr. Ritika. Ritika, please. Thank you, sir. I will now welcome amongst us our expert speaker, Dr. Pankaj Mitra, Association of Indian Universities, AIU, New Delhi, former Vice Chancellor, BPS Mahila Vishwa Vidyalaya, Khanpur Sonipat, Dr. Mithil, Secretary General of the Association of Indian Universities, is the second woman Secretary General of the Association in its 95 years of existence. Prior to joining AIU, she has been serving the higher education sector, especially university education, for over three decades at the apex regular of higher education, the University Grants Commission of India. Dr. Mithil is a Fulbright scholar and has a wide ranging experience of over three decades in higher education, in policy planning and management of higher education. Dr. Mittal earlier served as the first regular vice chancellor of Bhagat Phool Singh Mahila Vishwavidyalaya Khanpur, the first ruler woman university of North India in 2008 at a young age of 44 years to undertake an onerous task of developing a tiny gurukul into an institution of repute. Dr. Mittal introduced a series of innovative practices and reforms as the vice chancellor of the only ruler residential multi faculty women's state university of the country, imparting education to 7,000 girls from KG till PhD level in a holistic manner. During her stint as the vice chancellor, Dr. Mittal also transformed the Gurukul into a university, which is now on the international map with collaborations with universities like University of Baltimore, USA, and all. Um, a recipient of many awards and honors, Dr. Mittal has also published a number of papers, articles, occasional papers and reports on issues relating to higher education and women empowerment in national and international journals. We are privileged to have you amongst us today, ma'am. I now request you to kindly enlighten us on the NEP 2020. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Ritika. Thanks for a very, very generous introduction. And uh, thanks to Professor Hoda for inviting me here and for giving me a chance to interact with all of you. And thanks to Professor Vyas and Professor Mukhopadhyay, who spoke before me. Dr. Hoda, I'm sorry I could not hear fully because my net connection was gone in between. So I could not take advantage of many of your couplets. In the end, I could listen to two or three only. Maybe I, I, I assume there was must be many, many more in the in there. So sorry for that. Uh, but then uh, Ritika, in the beginning, she spoke about uh, a quote from uh, Dr. A. P. J. Abdul Kalam. So I'll also start with a quote from Dr. A. P. J. Abdul Kalam and taking. Uh, Q from Dr. Hoda, a couplet. I will not couplet. It was what he spoke in Hindi. I will speak. Uh, he said that सपने देखो, पर सपने वो सपने नहीं देखो जो आप सोते हुए देखते हैं, वो सपने देखो जो आपको सोने नहीं देते। तो ये national policy and education is a policy जो आपको सोने नहीं देगी। अगर आपको इसको implement करना है, अगर आपको इसके सचमुच में सारे fruits लेने हैं, जो इसका फायदा लेना है आपको सपने देखने पड़ेंगे और वही सपने देखने पड़ेंगे जो आपको सोने नहीं देंगे तो इस 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 थॉट के साथ आई विल स्टार्ट माय लेक्चर ऑन नेशनल पॉलिसी एंड एजुकेशन टुडे थैंक यू डॉक्टर होदा सी नेशनल पॉलिसी ऑन एजुकेशन वाज आई मीन व्हेन डॉक्टर कस्तूरी रंगन सबमिटेड इट इट वाज अ बिग डॉक्यूमेंट ऑफ 500 पेजेस और सो बट नाउ द policy is a concise policy of only 66 pages but still many a times people in india you know people are not fond of reading it is said that if you go to a foreign country and start speaking something in front of a officer he will give you a paper and say ki aap isko likh dijiye jo bhi aapka issue hai aap likh dijiye and then we will attend to it and india if you go with a pile of papers to a person and says ki this is my issue to paper ke file ko side mein rakhega aur bolega bata problem kya hai 
so that is the difference in how india operates and how rest of the uh, countries operate so isile all the policy is there and it is written in not a very difficult language but still people don't tend to read it they tend to listen hamare yahan sunne se zyada samajh mein aata hai rather than padhne se basically i thought i'll give a small lecture on what national policy is basically kya iske main recommendations hain and how it why it is called a forward looking innovative say democratic and a student centric policy democratic it is a democratic policy aisa bola jata hai ye janta ki policy hai kyunki janta se vichar vimarsh karke ye policy banayi gayi hai because when this policy was made something about 34 years of the last policy this is the third policy for the country first policy was in 1968 second in 1986 and now this is the third policy in 2020 after 34 years of the last policy so when this policy was made the consultation was done with something like 2 and 1/2 lakh people so and 2 and 1/2 lakh people not only from universities and colleges not only from the education system but from common people also starting from panchayat level till the highest level so this is a policy of the people by the people so therefore it is called a democratic policy and student centric policy because it is a policy in which the student because in any case student is our primary stakeholder and all the universities all the colleges all the vice chancellors all the teachers are existing because of the students so this policy is also existing because of the students and the students are the primary stakeholders and they have been given the utmost they are the center center of this policy so therefore it is a student centric policy so i'll start from the top what they are talking about the architecture of the policy uh, architecture of the higher education system then i'll come down to university level what changes are there at the university level then program level what changes are there what is there in the policy for the teachers and what is there in the policy for the students so i suppose professor hoda i have around half an hour with me 40 minutes what you you have at least 45 minutes okay okay then i will start uh, uh, with that so when you talk of higher education architecture right now in india we have ugc which is uh, the body which is doing the coordination and maintenance of standards and it is also doing the funding of higher education then there are 17 statutory professional councils who are looking after their own profession like aict for engineering medical council and law commission for uh, medical education nursing council pharmacy council council of architectures bar council for law so like this there are many many councils so they are looking after their own professional subject and also giving the license to practice but then there are many many overlaps between these bodies and then nowhere in the world uh, regulation and funding is done by the same body so for the policy is trying to correct these issues and a corrective measure is taken by amalgamating many of these bodies like ugc icit and ncit will be merged to form a body called hecki higher education commission of india and this hecki will be sort of an umbrella organization which will be having four verticals and those four verticals will be first vertical will be national higher education regulatory council which will be regulating the higher education in terms of coordination and maintenance of standards and i like i was saying that not every i mean mostly in no country the regulation and funding is done by the same same body therefore here also they have separated out the funding by having a body called hegc higher education grant council which will only do the funding of the higher education institutions and third body will be national accreditation council which will look after accreditation and the fourth body will be general education council which will be talking about the curriculum national higher education qualification framework about the graduate attributes so each of these four bodies will have a totally separate function and they will be working on a uh, public disclosure manners so so that they they are uh, not governed by anything they are also transparent they are also autonomous but they are working within their own domain in a totally transparent manner for example nac national accreditation council so right now you when you talk of accreditation process in india it is institutional accreditation by nac or it is program wise accreditation by nba which is only for engineering technology and management for general subjects program wise accreditation is not existing what this nac will be doing is because in future basically uh, accreditation is going to be a way of regulation so regulations i mean maintenance of standards will be done through the accreditation 
Therefore, there will be large number of institutions which will be required to be accredited, and there will be a large number of programs which will be required to be accredited. Therefore, the policy says that there should be NAC, which will be a meta accrediting agency. That means it will accredit the bodies which will accredit. That means they will be approving multiple accreditation bodies in addition to NAC and NBA, which will be accrediting the institutions as well as the programs. So similarly, each body has been given its own defined function. And the present statutory councils like, uh, say, Medical Council or Bar Council, they have been converted into professional standard setting bodies. So these professional standard setting bodies will be deciding the standards for their own subject. They will be deciding who should be given the license to practice, what should be the curriculum, what type of knowledge they should be having, the ones who are wanting to learn the professional subject. So this is with regard to the overall architecture of the higher education. Now we come to restructuring of universities. So what type of restructuring of universities is envisaged in the national policy on education? It says right now in our country, we have 1,000 universities, we have 40,000 colleges. So the policy says some universities are very, very small universities. Some colleges are very, very small colleges. There are colleges which are less than 100 students or less than 200 students. So the policy says that we should have large higher education institutions, large universities, multidisciplinary universities. That is, there should not be any single disciplinary university. Every university should be, I mean, the student should be having the option of studying any subject in a university. It's not that there should be a law university, medical university, engineering university, or technical university, or agriculture university. Every university should be a multidisciplinary university where the students can learn multiple subjects. So that is the intent of the policy. And then they also say that the university should be divided into research intensive universities, teaching intensive universities and then there can be degree awarding colleges. So what is research intensive university? Research intensive university, they'll be doing more teaching and research, but more emphasis will be on research. And teaching intensive university, the more emphasis will be on teaching. Apart from that, I told you about 40,000 colleges which are there in our country. So those colleges right now are affiliated colleges, means they are affiliated to some university because colleges do not have the power to grant degree. So the degrees to the degrees are awarded by the universities with which these colleges are affiliated. So those colleges will be given the degree awarding power in a phased manner. That is, they will become autonomous colleges and they will be given the power to award degree. So what will what what will be the work on the part of the universities? I mean, because when you talk of implementation of this policy, it is not that the government has to do everything. A lot of implementation activities have to be taken up by the universities also. So universities have to empower their colleges. They have to handhold their colleges so that they become capable themselves for awarding the degree, for framing the curriculum, for conducting the examination, for taking the examinations and evaluating the answer sheets and so the colleges have to become autonomous colleges graded autonomy will be given to the colleges the colleges have to equip themselves in terms of one infrastructure second capacity building of the teachers and capacity building of the various processes which are being done in the college for example examinations so the policy when they talk of restructuring of universities they talk of complete abolition of the affiliation structure which in any case was a british legacy with us because britishers left it for us till britishers came there was no affiliation system britishers brought affiliation system with them to the country then they left and then when they left in their own country they abolished the affiliation system but we are still continuing with our affiliation system so the policy says abolish the affiliation system, let the colleges stand on their own, let them be autonomous colleges and let them be degree awarding colleges. And slowly, slowly these degree awarding colleges will convert into first teaching uh, intensive universities and then research intensive universities and then Meru, which is a uh, multidisciplinary research oriented university. So this is the feel, I mean, this is what the policy intends to do. And then it also says because so far, there was a lot of fight in our country for running the online program. And uh, UGC were res restricting the universities to offer online program on the premise that the quality should not be compromised because online the number of students are large. So the policy, I mean, the quality can be compromised. 
Therefore, it was saying that, okay, if you want to offer online programs, you must come and take the approval of UGC. Now, the policy is giving a lot of autonomy to the universities. So, it says that we, there is no need to uh, sort of examine each and every university and each and every proposal for running the online program. So, if the university is having a high A grade, maybe A or A plus grade, they should be given the permission to run online programs. So, all the universities who are having a high NAC rating, they will be given the permission to run the online programs. And in uh, consonance with the policy, UGC has already issued the regulations about 15, 20 days back, in which all these provisions are there about the online programs. So that is another thing. And then one more thing which the policy says that it should be a multidisciplinary university. So like just before uh, coming to this webinar, I was attending a webinar of agricultural universities where they were making a uh, the implementation strategy for implementing the policy in agricultural universities. They were finding it very, very difficult that how will we make agricultural universities or the multidisciplinary universities? But then many, many methods were suggested in that meeting also that how to make themselves multidisciplinary university. So every like now the your college, this uh, Bharti Vidya Peet Institute of uh, Computer Science and Management. This is also becoming multi-faculty slowly, slowly. Earlier, it was only computer science and management was added. And now law is added. And many, many more disciplines are added. Similarly, every university has to become multidisciplinary so that the students can uh, have a holistic development. They, If they want to learn multiple disciplines, they can. In a single disciplinary university, there are many, many uh, sort of impediments in the way of the student for learning it many more subjects so every university should be a multidisciplinary university including the sanskrit university sanskrit of course has been given a lot of importance in this policy but even for sanskrit university it is saying that there should be multidisciplinary university then one more thing <coughs> which because this policy policy talks about autonomy independence uh, a lot of freedom to the universities it also talks about a body called board of governors it says for the good universities, board of governors can be there, and that board of governors will see oversee the functioning of the university, and including the appointment of the vice chancellor. There is a lot of allegations many times that there is a lot of political interference in the appointment of vice chancellors. So the policy itself says that to rule out all those things, there should be a board of governors who should oversee, especially the good universities who are able to manage themselves and who will not misuse this type of autonomy. And that BOG itself will appoint the vice chancellor of the university and there will not be any government interference in the appointment of the vice chancellor. So these type of freedoms are given in the policy. Now, after the restructuring of universities, I'll come to restructuring of programs. Then what type of restructuring of academic programs will be given there? The policy says that uh, the programs, like for example, we were having three-year bachelor's degree program. The policy now says that it should be a four-year degree program, and then it will be in liberal arts in the sense uh, when we used to say earlier ki chosat kala sampoon education. So those chosat kala was not uh, painting, dancing, music. It was also physics. It was also astronomy. It was also chemistry. It was also medicine. So those chosat kala included almost all the disciplines of higher education. So the policy says that all the disciplines of higher education, if you have to teach to a student, that all means it cannot be all, but if you want to teach many disciplines of higher education, three year graduation will not be good enough. So the, the student should be, the government should, this, uh, our university should switch over to a four year degree program, liberal education program, and a, some component of research can also be added. And if it is a four year BSc with the research, then the admission to PhD can be straight away after BSc. There's no need to do masters also. So after four year degree program, there can be direct admission to PhD also. It also says that uh, when I was saying that it is uh, making the students as a king, it is giving a lot of freedom to the students and the freedom when I say it is the freedom in many, many ask aspects, freedom of choosing a subject, freedom of choosing a discipline, freedom of choosing a university, rather multiple universities in a program and freedom of speed, the speed with which you want to learn. So to do that, the policy is advocating multiple entry and exit. Multiple and entry and exit, how will it work? Suppose you take admission in say BSc program and you are not able to continue after first year, then 
you have to leave it could be any reason it could be marriage it could be financial problem it could be health problem it could be any issue any family problem so you can leave after first year right now what do you get if you leave in one year nothing no certification only a mark sheet you have if you leave in two years you get nothing so now the policy says if a candidate has to leave in between after first year he'll get a certificate if he leaves after two years he'll get a diploma and if he leaves after three years or four years there will be a degree so how does it help suppose a candidate leaves after two years and he wants to come back to higher education after say five years so straight away he can get admission in the third year as a lateral entry he doesn't have to do first and second year again which is the present scenario and that too in any university it's not that he has to come to the same university he can go to any university and get admission in the third year if he has done first year and got a certificate with that certificate he can go to any university and get admission in the second year so this type of freedom is there and it also helps if you really don't want to come back then after first year the diploma so whatever skills you have acquired and you have a certification in the form of diploma or certificate so that can be used for getting a job or so multiple entry and multiple exit is there and phil has been closed for valid reasons because people who do and phil generally go for phd and uh, the UGC, which had earlier given the exemption to the MPhil degree holders for from net examination, that is also not there. So MPhil was almost becoming a redundant degree. Therefore, MPhil has been closed and straight away. Rather, not only masters, even after graduation, you can get admission in PhD. So that type of thing is there. And then one more thing, because the policy says that we have in India been talking about the rote learning. I mean, whenever the examinations are there, they basically check your memorizing skill, that how much of the memory you have. The policy says that we should be promoting creativity. We should be promoting uh, application-oriented uh, teaching. We should be promoting the problem-solving skills. We should be teaching the uh, sort of arouse the curiosity of the students. So the method of teaching will be different. And the student should be learning by doing. So for learning by doing, internships are required. And internship right now is there in the engineering, it is there in the management, it is there in the law. Most of the professional subjects are having internship. But for say BCom, for BA, for BSc, no internships are there. So now the policy says that for every subject, there should be multiple internships so that the students get experiential learning. So for experiential learning, internships are required in every course, every program, and the universities are bound to arrange internships for their students. It could be in industry, it could be in business houses, it could be in offices, it could be in a, any type of setup where the experiential learning is given to the student based on the course he is pursuing. So that is there. And the most innovative concept, most innovative concept of uh, policy is ABC. What is ABC? ABC is academic bank of credit so what is academic bank of credit academic bank of credit is like you have a commercial bank similarly there is a credit bank in commercial bank you deposit money in credit bank you deposit credits and how do you deposit credits and what is a credit sometimes our students do not even know what is a credit so Credit definition in every university is a different definition. Every university has a different, uh, every, sorry, not every university, every country has a different definition of credit. And in India, mostly one credit is, that one credit is equal to an hour of studies in one week. And generally our semesters are of 15 weeks. Therefore, one credit means 15 hours of teaching. So if it is a one credit course, that means it will involve 15 hours of teaching. If it is a two credit course, it will involve 30 hours of teaching. If it is a three credit course, it will involve 45 hours of teaching. So based on the expense of the subject, based on the depth of the course, you decide how many credits will be required for each course. So once you take it major rest, and then what one, one major change which will happen because of ABC is, how will you deposit credits in ABC is, that right now you take admission in the full, say, BTEC program or MBA program. And BTEC program, suppose it has something like 20 papers or 30 papers in four years. So those 30 papers are 30 courses. So with this ABC, you can take admission in different papers or different courses in different universities. So out of those 30 papers of BTEC, you can do three papers from your university, three papers from JNU, three papers from, say, Delhi University, three papers from Hyderabad Universities, four papers from some... Calcutta University. So 
those 20 papers can be segregated into different universities and that means the university will also give admission to courses in addition to the program so there's no need to take admission in the full program if you really want to pursue education which is a, a free flowing education as a freelancer if you really want to learn from many universities don't take admission in a program, take admission in courses in various universities. These could be face-to-face -face courses, these could be online courses, these could be courses in a uh, foreign university also. So once you have completed a course, say from Delhi University, and then you go to the credit ABC, I mean, they will be having an account like you, have, like you have an account in a commercial bank, you will be having an account in a credit bank, you go to the bank and say, I have done this course from this university and for with these this type of credits and these many credits and this is my grade point so the credit bank will keep on accumulating your credits in the bank and you keep on accumulating credits from various sources from various universities and once you have the threshold number of credits for example generally for a ba program you need around 120 credits and suppose you have accumulated 200 credits in your bank so you will go with 120 credits which are relevant for that particular BA to a university from where you have done the maximum number of courses and you will say that redeem these 120 credits for a degree. So the university will redeem those 120 credits for a degree, you will get a degree and your account which was having 200 credits will now have, 100 and, uh, will now have 80 credits because 120 you have already used. The way you when you take out the money you your balance is reduced similarly you take out the credits you take the degree and the balance will be reduced so this is the concept of abc in which you can get a degree from multiple universities i mean you can study in multiple universities and the degree can be given by one university and now these credits you can accumulate over a period of time one year two years five years ten years but then every credit will also have a shelf life shelf life means the validity of credit for example suppose there is a credit in say uh, history or languages or literature that will have a longer shelf life of something like 10 years and uh, a course which is advanced course like somebody was talking about machine language robotics iot ai so these type of courses will have a shorter shelf life so once a credit uh, completes its shelf life means once it is not a valid credit in terms of the shelf life then it cannot be redeemed for a degree but of course it will remain in your bank as a certification that yes you have done this credit so that shelf life will also be there so this is the concept of abc in which a student can learn from multiple university he can learn multiple courses he can pursue his passion whatever he wants to learn i mean it, it is not necessary that if he is doing bsc physics he should do only chemistry and mathematics he can do music he can do painting he can do economics he can do political science any type of subjects he wants to do so that type of flexibility that's why i was talking about the dreams that this type these things of these things are something which we used to dream when we were students so today it is becoming true so this is sort of a dream come true for many of the students so students would be very very happy with this Similarly, there is a restructuring of BA programs. Now, there will be a four-year BA program. Again, you know that the school, I mean, the feeder cater for higher education is a school cater. And if school children are not groomed well, obviously, the material we get for the higher education will be bad. Therefore, a lot of importance has been given to teacher education. That the teachers who teach the school students, they are very, very important. So a four-year BA program so that if I really want to go to teaching profession, I should decide after 12th class and take four-year BA program. It should not be that if I didn't get anything else, then I go to teaching. So teaching should be a choice profession, first choice. So therefore, they are saying four-year BA degree program and that will be, there's a lot of restructuring in for the teacher education program. Similarly, internationalization. Internationalization, again, the policy is talking too much about internationalization. I think this is the first policy in which a very, very uh, innovative concepts have been given with regard to internationalization of higher education. For example, our universities can go abroad and set up campuses. Earlier, it was not that easy. Now it is very, very easy. You can go to foreign countries and establish your campuses, and you can promote Indian culture, Indian knowledge system, Indian, say, strong points, maybe USPs with regard to yoga, 
or Ayurveda or whatever you want to teach or maybe if you are have very good in AI, Internet of Things or all those things. So whatever you want to teach, you can go and establish your campuses abroad. Similarly, top 100 foreign universities can come and establish their campuses in India. Now, this is a bit, uh, I mean, debatable issue where some people are saying it is good, some people are saying it is bad. In my view, it is very, very good because if we have top 100 universities in India, it will help our universities in a number of ways. For example, right now, uh, about seven to eight lakh students go every year from India to abroad for studies. And how many come back to India? Only about 46,000. So seven to eight lakh students who are going out of India for studying abroad, they are spending something like $2 billion every year. So, so much of foreign exchange is going out. So if these universities come here, one, we will be saving on the foreign exchange. Second, these universities, uh, the students who are studying in these universities, their cost of uh, living is because it's less in India. So their overall cost of education will also reduce. So they will be saving on the overall cost. Then our existing universities, they can do a lot of collaborations with these universities. It could be student exchange, teacher exchange. There, there can be lectures from Forest Way. There can be joint research projects. There can be joint teaching collaborations. So a lot of collaborations are possible once you are physically with, uh, in close vicinity. And lastly, I also feel that uh, there will be a sense of competition among our universities if they feel that the students are going out to those countries. Obviously, they will work in a more competitive manner so that they can attract students to their universities rather than they going to the foreign. So this will increase. I mean, I feel that uh, the entry of foreign universities in India, which was long pending for a long time, this bill was pending with the uh, Rajya Sabha and Lok Sabha. So now that has also come true. And apart from that, the uh, credits which are earned in the foreign universities, again, for the first time, the policy says that the credits earned in the foreign universities can be transferred to Indian universities for getting a degree. And for that matter, the policy also says that uh, if we want to promote internationalization of higher education in India, then every university must establish an international office. Because when foreign students come to India, and if they do not get proper attention, if they do not get proper infrastructure, and they run from pillar to post, and when they go back to their country after studying here, they, they don't become our brand ambassadors. They rather tell them that don't, don't go to India. It's a very difficult scenario over there. So every university should have an international office to take care of the foreign students so that they really become our brand ambassadors. And we do have many, many foreign students. Because minded foreign students as well as foreign teachers are very important landmarks for rankings also. Because when rankings are done by either by QS or THS, the these two are also counted as important parameters for getting a better rank. So that was with regard to internationalization. Then what is there in the policy for faculty? Again, faculty have been given a lot of importance. There are a lot of uh, uh, sort of autonomy, freedom has been given to the faculty. They will decide what to teach, how to teach, and how to assess their children. So what to teach, when I say that, I'm not saying that every faculty will be framing their own curriculum. There will be an overall curriculum, which will be done by GEC. But the faculty will be having a lot of liberty of tweaking with the curriculum in keeping with the latest advancements of knowledge, in keeping with the local conditions, in keeping with the regional conditions. So curriculum flexibility is there. And how to teach? See, right now in India, we are teaching in a method which is promoting rote learning. And uh, what we do is, I mean, if in Hindi, I should say, we hum class in class, we go to the house and go to the foreign countries, we study in the house and go to the house and go to class. In terms of this, that the reading material, hai, audios, hai, videos, hai, वो सबका सब बच्चों को दे दिया जाता है वो घर से पढ़ के आते हैं और क्लास में सिर्फ डिस्कशन होता है जब खाली डिस्कशन होता है तो क्या होता है अंडरस्टैंडिंग बेटर होती है एप्लीकेशन ओरिएंटेड नॉलेज होती है उसमें प्रॉब्लम सॉल्विंग टेक्निक्स बच्चों को पता चलती है तो इसलिए पॉलिसी में ये कहा गया है वी आर कॉलिंग इट फ्लिप्ड क्लासरूम मॉडल बिकॉज इट इज टोटली फ्लिप टाइमिंग वी आर फ्लिपिंग ऑफ की ऐसा नहीं जैसे पहले हम करते हैं कि क्लास में पढ़ाएंगे घर पे जाके मनन करेंगे उससे बिल्कुल उल्टा कर रहे हैं घर से पढ़ के आइए क्लास में मनन करेंगे तो फ्लिप क्लासरूम मॉडल बच्चे टीचर्स अपना सकते हैं मतलब पूरा फ्लेक्सिबिलिटी है उनको एंड सेकेंडली असेसमेंट एंड इवेल्युएशन ऑल्सो वाई शुड ए टीचर डिपेंड ऑन ए थ्री आर एग्जामिनेशन एट द एंड ऑफ द सेमिस्टर इज नॉट 
एडवाइज इट्स नॉट इवन एडवाइजेबल बिकॉज पूरे सेमेस्टर में बच्चे को जब टीचर देख रहे हैं दे नो हाउ द स्टूडेंट इज परफॉर्मिंग इन द्लास देर आर मल्टीपल वेज ऑफ असेसिंग स्टूडेंट देर आर क्विजेज देर आर असाइनमेंट देर आर से ग्रुप डिस्कशन projects are there are so many ways are there so why should we only depend on a 3 hour examination which is basically testing rote learning so the flexibility has been given to the teachers that you can assess and evaluate your students based on multiple ways there should be open book examinations right now what is happening is policies promoting open book examination but our teachers are not even trained to frame questions for open book examination It's not easy to make a paper for open book examination unless you are trained for it. So a lot of capacity building exercises will be required for our teachers, and the policy does recognize this fact. It does that yes, this capacity building exercises will be required, and does promote that yes, there should be many many activities to do the capacity building of the teachers by training them, whether online or offline. But a lot of training is required for online teaching. for uh, <clears throat> doing multiple ways of teaching means uh, through maybe face to face blended and flipped classroom and then how to assess and evaluate so all these trainings will be given to the students and also on developing oer means open education resource which can be like it could be moocs courses on the swayam platform it could be anything so all that facilities will be given to the teacher then second thing which generally our teachers सॉर्ट ऑफ कंप्लेन इज कि कोई टीचर पढ़ाए या ना पढ़ाए सबको बराबर टाइम पे प्रमोशन मिलना है सबको बराबर सैलरी मिलना है तो इंसेंटिव क्या है पढ़ाने का सबको सेम टाइम पे मिलना है तो पॉलिसी से रिकोगनाइज की ये इशू है तो उन्होंने ये बोला है कि देर विल बी फास्ट ट्रैक प्रमोशन फॉर द टीचर्स हु आर रियली डूइंग वेल हु आर रियली कंट्रीब्यूटिंग मोर देन वॉट दे आर रिक्वायर टू कॉन्ट्रीब्यूट फास्ट ट्रैक प्रमोशन होगा एंड एक्सीलेंस को उन्होंने कहा है कि एक्सीलेंस शुड बी प्रमोटेड by way of incentivizing the teacher it could be in terms of recognition it could be in terms of increment it could be in terms of salary it could be in terms of some fellowship anything but there should be some ways of incentivizing the teacher and one more thing for <coughs> teachers with the policy says is that just a bit ha uh, what they say is that if you see a teacher who has the administrative acumen in him or her if they have leadership skills in them then identify those teachers train them to become good vice chancellors like professor huda so he has the leadership qualities he has the administrative acumen so identify these teachers train them to become vice chancellors so when they become vice chancellors they are not sort of novice in their jobs so they know how to do vice chancellorship in a effective manner many times this happens that people i mean in our country we feel very shy a vice chancellor does not need any training why doesn't he need everybody needs a training if you really want to become effective you need a training so they are saying that the teachers who are experienced teachers who are good teachers who have these type of leadership skills they should be identified and they should be given the training on these matters so that they can become effective leaders in future so this type of things are being advocated in the policy then next is research again the policy says research has to be promoted it does uh, recognize that uh, in india if you talk in terms of gdp about 0.67% of the gdp is spent on research as against something like 4.3% in countries like israel so they are saying that there should be a lot more spending on research in higher education and for that purpose they are advocating establishment of a national research foundation so national research foundation will be a body which will be doing a lot of funding on research it doesn't mean that the bodies like dbt or icr or ugc which were already funding the research they will stop funding they will fund but it will be ensured that there is no duplication and the funded is funding is done in a coordinated manner and whether it is a small funding or a large funding the teachers are getting advantage of the funding so national research foundation is here. and lastly i have mostly spoken about the students that the students are the primary ones who will be benefited by this policy uh, in terms of multiple entry and exit in terms of abc in terms of freedom of choice i mean so much of choice is given to the students one last thing which i will also talk about the students is 
the availability of the open education resources. So today, the number of open education resources which are available to the students is too much. I mean, too many. In our times, we could we had to only depend upon our teacher, on our books. We used to go to the library. Whatever books we used to get, we used to study, and whatever teacher notes he used to, he or she used to give that only we used to study. But this is not the scenario today. Today, the students are having multiple open education resources that have cost on the touch, touch of a and on the tip of your finger, finger on their fingertips, or maybe I should say on the click of a mouse. So this type of resources are there. Today, if you did not get admission in IIT, you don't have to worry. IIT professor comes to your home and teaches you at your convenient time on your laptop. If you want to study from a foreign professor, he comes to your home, teaches you at your home at your convenient time on your laptop. So, so much of open education resources are there that if students really want to learn, the sky is the limit. I mean, there is so much of resources available. So, the only thing we need is a passion, passion to learn. And mind it, in future, the jobs will not be based on the degrees you receive. The jobs will be based on the knowledge you accumulate. I do remember in one of the conferences in IIM Bangalore, Anant Agarwal was there, who is the CEO of edX. edX is a MOOCs platform, which is uh, by Harvard University. So in that uh, webinar, in that uh, conference, he was telling webinar. Now we are saying webinar to everything. It was a conference in IIM Bangalore. So he was saying that he was standing on the airport. One student came running and he touched his feet. So he asked him, who are you? I don't even know you. He says, sir, aap mujhe nahi jante, par main aapko janta hu. So he says, ki, par mere pair kyo chhu rahe ho? He says, ki, kyunki aapki wajja se mujhe naukri mil gai. He says, I hardly know you. Main tumhe naukri lagne mein kaise help ka sakta hu? I don't even know you. He says, sir, main ne 10 courses kiye edX mein, aur main Tech Mahindra mein naukri ke liye gya, aur mere saath kuch aaye thi ke graduates bhi the, NIT bhi the, aur mera knowledge bhi sitna achha tha ki mera selection hua, unka nahi hua, in spite of having the degree from the best institution. So, in the coming years, degrees will not matter. Degrees will not matter. Degrees will not matter. Degrees will not matter. What will matter is that your knowledge base is how much. And in this time, all your knowledge is free. It's on your computer, on the internet. It's so much knowledge, so much information, so much courses, so much lectures. Because students have passion, they have to learn. So, there is no one who can't stop them. And there is no one who can't stop them. And there is no one who can't stop them. And there is no one who can't stop them. And there is no one who can't stop them. And there is no one who can't stop them. And there is no one who can't stop them. तो कोई आपको वैसे भी नहीं रोक सकता किसी भी जॉब के लिए नहीं रोक सकते कोई भी आई मीन जो हमेशा हम बार बार कहते हैं ना इसी इंस्टीट्यूशन में एडमिशन होगी पे पैकेज हायर हो जाएगा तो पे पैकेज आपको छोटे से छोटे इंस्टीट्यूशन में भी हायर हो जाएगा बिकॉज योर नॉलेज बेस इज सो बिग सो यू हैव टू नाउ कंसिडर इट इज नाउ दोनस लाइज ऑन द स्टूडेंट एंड द टीचर्स टीचर्स हैव टू गाइड देम दैट येस दे हैव टू सॉर्ट ऑफ टीच दे स्टूडेंट एंड देव टू अप्राइज दम की क्या क्या रिसोर्सेज है दे कैन गिव दम द लिंक दे कैन गिव दम द गाइडेंस की कैसे कैसे आपको ढूंढना है दे कैन गिव दम द लिंक्स की ये ये रिसोर्सेज आप पढ़ के आइए और क्लास में इसके बारे में डिस्कशन होगा पहले आई एम टॉकिंग अबाउट फ्लिप क्लास रूम मॉडल So I think this is the right and opportune moment for all the students to learn, learn, learn and learn, learn, unlearn and relearn. So that type of a uh, approach has to be followed by the students and the teachers have to be partners in that. And I feel the policy is very, very innovative. And if it is implemented in letter and spirit, it has the potential to transform India. जो हम बोलते हैं ना विश्व गुरु का कि इंडिया विश्व गुरु बनेगा तो विश्व गुरु वो पक्का बन जाएगा अगर ये पॉलिसी लेटर एंड स्पिरिट में इंप्लीमेंट की गई बट इंप्लीमेंटेशन अगेन वी शुड नॉट डिपेंड ओनली ऑन द गवर्नमेंट सेंट्रल गवर्नमेंट ऑफ द स्टेट गवर्नमेंट इंप्लीमेंटेशन हैज टू डिपेंड ऑन द वाइस चांसलर ऑन द यूनिवर्सिटीज ऑन द कॉलेजेस ऑन द टीचर्स एंड ऑन द स्टूडेंट्स हर एक की जिम्मेवारी है कि इस पॉलिसी को लेटर एंड स्पिरिट में इंप्लीमेंट करें Advance implemented. It is something. This we say. Na, sometimes we say policy is like a fairy tale. Fairy tale. If you really want to implement it, so you will also. I mean, you can get anything you want. Just a fairy tale story. So with that, I would like to end. And once again, I like to thank Professor Hoda for inviting me here and giving me a chance to interact with all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much, Madam. Thank you so much. You have given really. entire insight and underline the all premium benefits this policy could not have been explained in a such a shorter uh, span of just one hour in such an abstract manner but yet giving all possible details and that's how in the beginning i said that this policy has made everyone king 
the students king teachers king and the management also king <laughs> last week uh, last week i was talking to different uh, uh, management of different uh, institutions and they were afraid that what will happen to our institution we are running in a small uh, stand alone institution and then finally the solution in this policy is even if they, they are not in a position to expand themselves but then they can collaborate with other institution with the help of abc which we have just outlined and uh, then they can keep on offering programs in collaboration and become a kind of multidisciplinary institution and uh, moreover the institution need not to uh, worry about affiliation they have to become the autonomous decide their own uh, kind of the program which they are going to give decide their own fee structure decide, decide their own criteria and see to it that there are takers for that so thank you so much for giving in the detail you have already enumerated how teachers are going to become king in this policy how <laughs> students are king in the policy and uh, hopefully wherever there were dark areas those dark areas will be filled now with the help of the beauty of this policy and that's how in beginning i said this policy ka ek hi message hai ke yahi hai junoon mera yahi hai shauk mera chirag waha jala de jahan hai andhera to jahan jahan education sector mein darkness dikh rahi hai jahan bottlenecks hai ye policy un sab bottlenecks ko theek karne aayi hai dr ritika is uh, ready with the questions which participants have uh, posed so if you have time i i, I uh, understand uh, the, your constraints you are in the office and since morning busy and uh, attending different webinars talking in different webinars but i will request you at least 10 minutes for question answer and then after we can uh, uh, thank you formally so dr ritika if you are ready with the questions can you quickly go ahead yes, because ma'am has to go home also huh? she is uh, there in the office this morning uh, taking care of so many of sessions huh? please um i'm will quickly take a few questions uh, sure. the first question from one of our participant Uh, is objection of private unaided schools valid for NP 2020? I could not get means what objection means. Uh, the objection being raised by private unaided schools. I am not getting your question, Doctor Hoda. Are you able to understand the question? Yeah, basically uh, during consultation process, the participant is trying to ask. that during consultation process few obje objections were raised to the committee members whether the committee uh, dr kasturanjan committee has addressed to that, that or not i'm it sure i think uh, all those objections which uh, uh, would have been uh, meaningful to the committee committee must have addressed it if you have any information on that see i i am able to read some questions i think i will answer those questions uh, one question is with regard to unemployment correct it says uh, yes, that how, how the new education policy will address uh, the so i see yes, the it's a straight answer to that is policy i don't think policy should talk about employment or unemployment policy should talk about employability and unemployability whether you are employable or not there is a lot of difference between employment and employability the policy can only ensure that you are employable so for that policy says that there should be skill oriented education the integration of skills with the general education is pro proposed so that the employability of the candidate increases so once the employability is there then the second question whether you are get having those type of companies or those type of vacancies or those type of jobs that is not the in sort of domain area of the policy or the education space education space can only make you employable so don't talk about in unemployment talk about unemployability so the policy is definitely answering the question with regard to unemployability not the unemployment then <laughs> similarly there is some question with regard to what what will be uh, the nep will maintain the quality of research work when a mathematics students takes dance for enhancing the percentage again see whenever you when i was talking about the abc and when it is allowed that yes you can take any subject then it doesn't mean that every subject will be counted for getting the uh, enhancement in the percentage this is for your you want to learn anything you want to pursue your passion you learn anything but for percentage purposes only the subjects which 
which are the core subjects they will be counted it is not that you take music dance mathematics and then you say that i am getting the msc in mathematics the core area core papers in the mathematics have to be completed because otherwise how will they get the mathematics degree but dance you may take in addition to pursue your passion not for adding in the marks of the mathematics so that type of a issue is there then it says whether india has the infrastructure to cope up with the nep of course india has the infrastructure it, it is yes and no both india has the infrastructure but it has to create a lot of infrastructure also especially the technical infrastructure and i really feel that in future the government instead of spending on brick and mortar universities they will be spending more on the uh, <coughs> say technical infrastructure so that there are more devices with the students there are more networking issues are resolved and the bandwidth issues are resolved so more more the government has already formed committees and they have allocated money for this also for increasing the tech, uh, infrastructure of higher education the policy itself talks about uh, allocating 6% of gdp to education so this has been locked talked about for a long time but this time it seems that the policy is committed to allocating 6% of gdp to education uh, what else ritika Ritika, I am not able to hear you. Yeah, yeah, Ritika. Um, ma'am, am I audible now? Yeah, yeah. Yes, you are. Uh, ma'am, uh, we'll take uh, one more question. Is there a scope in NEP twenty twenty for an institution to start with single or few courses and later upgrade to multiple courses? See, the single and uh, single course institution are already existing. so that is what the policy is there that make them multidisciplinary so once they are saying that the existing single discipline should also become multidisciplinary that sort of as a corollary it is evident that you cannot now establish a single faculty institution so if you if a new institution is to be established it has to be, has to be multidisciplinary rather the ones who are already existing should also change to multidisciplinary uh, uh, ma'am one last question i think we can take whether government will have a budget to fund the government schools colleges and universities after nep 2020 see when they have made nep and then they have floated nep obviously they would be having money in their kitty to implement this nep otherwise there is no fun in bringing an nep which is which cannot be implemented so whatever resources are required on the part of the government obviously they will be spending and they are talking about spending more on education and i told you about 6% of gdp on education which will be a huge money yes ma'am uh, ma'am thank you so much for your time it was actually a wonderful session i would now invite professor mn hoda sir to uh, present you a certificate just as a token of remembrance for uh, the session of uh, Are uh, yours today? <laughs> it is. It is just for a record to remind you always that you have been the valued speaker of this fabulous uh, webinar in which uh, 90 plus uh, universities, the participants from 90 plus universities, have participated. So thank you thank so you much. Uh, thank you so much, Madam uh, Dr. Ritika. Certificate uh, network today, Dr. Ritika is uh, uh, little low. <laughs> Yeah, I think there is a problem. I'll be sharing again. Yeah, it's not visible. Maybe there are some bandwidth issues. Ah, some bandwidth issue. The bandwidth at her side is. Uh, yes, between. I so. suppose that. So in any case, Professor Hoda will send um, it. Ma'am, uh, the, the certificate is ready. <laughs> we'll mail it to you. Yes, ma'am. Within <laughs> so, a few it minutes. Will, it, it will get, get um, displayed. Displayed. Meanwhile, you may invite Professor A K Sani. Yes. Uh, yes, sir. I now request Professor A K Sani. from uh, university school of management studies uh, vice president computer society of india and iit dean university school of management studies ggs ipu to propose the vote of thanks over to you saini sir i think the certificate is also now visible yes, it is visible <laughs> thank you thank you professor thank you thank you uh, thank you ritika i think first of all we should clap for this because certificate is now visible to all I think we must uh, thank our valued speaker, Dr. Pankaj Mittal. <clears throat> okay, uh, 
let me at the very outset because dr pankaj mittal has uh, very nicely and a very short time span has been able to really give us a flavor of what this nep which actually has come after almost 34 years of uh, our last education policy we had and i think uh, this is trying to bring in a lot of revolutionary ch revolution ch changes also in the education landscape i think just to to highlight some of these things which she mentioned i think the first which she just uh, just said uh, is that the gdp uh, 6% of gdp is going to be spent on the education sector this is a, i think very very important factor and the involvement of private sector also is going to be in this which is going to really contribute and fund this, uh, this kind of provision which have been made in the ap 2020 Secondly, because the government is trying to really achieve the GER, uh, which basically which is around 26% at this time, part of time to over 50%. So that's another milestone which is very important from the perspective of the, the country as a whole. That means we are trying to improve the literacy among the people and trying to basically that access part, access and equity and the quality. I think the, these are the three different uh, parameters which are important for any society and for any country as such, which are going to be interest by this policy. I think this has been very nicely brought out. And I think if you look at uh, the, the kind of changes which have been brought in the undergraduate education, and that too specifically when you talk of multidisciplinary and multi entry and multiple exit, I think this is going to change the whole paradigm of education and uh, opening up a lot of opportunities for those who cannot really continue the education uh, on, on a continuous basis. The kind of uh, that um, uh, credit bank, I think that's going to be very new feature which. Uh, we, we call a CBCS in true spirit going to be implemented um, by the government. I think this is one of the uh, kind of uh, initiative which has been indicated. Then we have other features like National Testing Agency we conducted conducting one single test for all this for all the uh, institutions across the country and uh, flexibility to the students in terms of choosing the courses which they want uh, right right from the secondary stage itself. Another very important thing is that technology has been given a very prominent space in the entire NEP. And if you see that the chapters 23, 24, they are totally devoted to technology interventions in improving and reaching out to the, all the all the unreached uh, say, category of students. I think this is going to be a very major change in the existing uh, mode of education we find. And uh, even setting up agencies uh, which are going to really help institutions in developing contents identify those contents, making use of the digital resources which we have. And uh, another thing which I think the person, uh, Dr. Pitta also mentioned about the research funding, I think that's going to be across all the institutions, which is going to be done in a coordinated manner. And uh, I think these are some of the uh, things basically, in short, if you have to say that basically it's, it's, a, uh, it's an attempt to make our youth future ready and focusing on the national goals and aligning with the sustainable development goals, which we all are supposed to be say working towards for the 2030. So in, in brief, we say that uh, I think uh, we, we are moving towards a paradigm, we say what to, moving from what to think to how to think. I think that that's the kind of spirit which is there in the NEP. But I think uh, a very important point is, of course, having a policy is just fine and a roadmap you tend to draw. But the implementation is a big challenge. I think that is going to be the, 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 the point which needs to be focused upon. Because policies are only just kind of a roadmap, but I think the way it is going to be implemented, and that we all have a role to play, whether it is the central government or the state government or the universities and the society. I think all have to play their role. So I think the implementation would be the, the key to the success of this these goals which we are trying to uh, look forward. So at the uh, end of this, I think this has been understood very clearly with the uh, all the provisions which are there. I think we must thank our esteemed speaker for today, Dr. Pankaj Mittal. Um, I think I also I also had the opportunity to visit our university and the vice chancellor, and I on different occasions we have interacted. I think, th thank you very much, ma'am, for uh, sparing your time. I think and sharing your thoughts on this. Uh, we also thank you to Dr. R. K. Vyas, the president of CSI, for sharing his thoughts on, from the perspective of the, the professional societies. And uh, we also had uh, Dr. Uh, Krishna Murthy, Professor Subroto, uh, and all the esteemed participants actually who have spared that time. And I think I can see that there was about 280 plus coming from different 90 plus universities which Professor Koda mentioned. I think that's, that's uh, that shows the kind of interest which all uh, all of us have in knowing what actually is going to come up for us. 
So thank you so much, all esteemed participants on behalf of the organizers. And I must compliment the organizer, Professor Hona, again known for his quality activities uh, uh, in different domains. Thank you so much. Over to Dr. Ritika. Thank you so much, sir. I thank all our distinguished panelists and participants to have continuously supported us. To all of you who have joined us today on this webinar room is now converted to a call center. Any participant who is having a problem with their certificate, uh, they may kindly share their email ID on the chat with everyone. We are all there to help you out with your certificate so thank you so much madam uh, for uh, sparing your time and uh, very much. Now, now you can very good and, uh, move to your home thank you sir thank you thank you thank you So, dear participants, this room is converted to a call center to enable, the enable you to get a certificate. Yeah, Professor Vyas, you are here. Professor Saini is also here. The president is also here. The vice president is also here. So, dear participants, if you are not part of any of our WhatsApp group, we have shared the link of uh, one of the WhatsApp group. You can click here and join this WhatsApp group. This is a better mechanism to get information and also the link of the forthcoming webinars because most of the time I am finding that participants are writing from different parts of the country that they have not received uh, email, they have not received link and when I reply to them that check your spam folder then they confirm yes sir I have received. So also join a WhatsApp group this will help you to get quick information from our side. Thank you so much. Those who have got certificate they can write thanks and they may leave to join for next uh, forthcoming webinar. If you have not registered, buy now for uh, forthcoming webinars. You please register before the registration is closed. And uh, there are other forthcoming activities like international conference approved by IEEE, IndiaCom, the separate uh, web page is there. Then our international journal, the BGIT published by Springer Nature. And of course, uh, the faculty development program and refresher program. If you if it is of your interest, you may register for them. And the papers of journal can be accessed by every one of you free of cost through your member ID. So once you log in with your member ID, you have a facility to access uh, all those papers free of cost, which otherwise is available only through uh, subscription mode. So those who have got certificate, please uh, write thanks and you may leave. And those who have not got certificate, you should not leave the meeting room. We are here till. 30 to see to it that what are your problems and can we resolve your problem if you are here in the meeting room we commit to give you certificate if you leave the meeting room i'm very sorry we won't be in a position to help you out outside the webex meeting room on your whatsapp on your email id etc etc so please be part of this meeting room unless you get certificate thank you so much If you have not filled up the feedback form, please fill up the feedback form. Once you fill up the feedback form, certificate will auto-generate it. And if you do not get it, then you come back with your name and email ID. Don't leave the meeting room because the meeting room has been locked. Once you leave it, you won't be in a position to enter it again. Please note. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Oh, thank and you, so much, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ritika. I think you are now ready for uh, joining the training for becoming DC. <laughs> yes. She has invited you. You are the first candidate registered. It will be Sir, blessings <laughs> of the elders. Blessing is there. Oda sir, there to guide you. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Purple life, remove him from the race. <laughs> No, no, no. I will no, follow no, his footsteps. No, no, we, we, we can't. We, we, no day we can uh, raise him up. <laughs> no yes, sir. But uh, you definitely. <laughs> very, very well doing. Thank okay. you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Priyadarshini, ma'am, uh, the feedback link is there in the chat window. So kindly scroll the chat window in which you are writing this message. You will find the feedback link. Kindly fill that feedback link and only then can your certificate be generated, ma'am.
to any participant who has not uh, filled the feedback link as yet please fill the feedback link first only then your certificate will be generated if you do not fill the feedback link because it's an automated process we will not be able to help you with the certificate the feedback link has been posted again in the chat window uh, yes i hope priyadarshini ma'am now you can fill up the feedback form any other participant who have not filled the feedback form as yet kindly find the link in the chat window kindly fill it up so that your certificate can be generated if after submitting the feedback form you do not receive the certificate in your inbox for let's say 10 minutes at the most you can share your email id with us in the chat window with all the panelists we will help you out with your uh, certificate um anu ma'am it's there in the chat window just above your message kindly scroll it's just above your message thank you dr amit chopra wonderful to have you we would uh, like, like to have you again on our next webinar on 16th october Thank you so much to all the participants who are writing nice and encouraging, encouraging words in the chat window. If you have got your certificate, you may leave and join us for next webinar on 16th. That is to a very important uh, topic for the researcher, publication ethics and uh, plagiarism. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Amit Chopra ji from GNDU Amritsar. Thank you so much, Professor Shah Jahan. If you are not part of any of the WhatsApp group, do to join a WhatsApp group. We have shared link. We are again sharing the link so that you can receive information in time. Because many of the time, email delivery fails. So information on WhatsApp is a very handy mechanism. So you may join any of the WhatsApp group. We have shared one of the link of the WhatsApp group. If you are not by now member of any of the WhatsApp group, if you are already in any of the WhatsApp group, then please do not join us again. Uh, anu ma'am, we will check it. I have noted your message that our WhatsApp group is showing full. Don't worry, we will check from the back end. You can try again after some time. Another, another uh, group link, just a minute. Give me a minute time. I will post another group's uh, link. I have shared another group. You can click on this group. Just now I have shared. You can click on this group and join it. Another group link has been, WhatsApp group link has been shared with the participants. All those who could not join the previous group can join this new group. Any participant who has uh, submitted the feedback form and has not received the certificate as yet, uh, they can kindly post their uh, email ID in the chat window. We are there to help you out. Thank you to all the participants who have received their certificate. You may log out now. We hope to meet you again on 16th October. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Nefri. You got your certificates, wrote encouraging words. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Tushar.
Dilip sir, uh, the feedback link is on the chat window. It's not in the question answer section. It's there in the chat window. I hope you have uh, filled the feedback form and received your certificate. Thank you so much, Mr. Shabash Jagalanji. Attend, register our forthcoming webinars and attend. Uh, Dheeraj Raturi, sir, we will just check your uh, certificate. Uh, kindly post your mail ID to all the panelists. Uttam, sir, I am sharing the mail ID of uh, Dheeraj Raturi, sir. Kindly check for his certificate. I hope, sir, you have filled the feedback form. Uh, Dheeraj Raturi, sir, uh, your uh, certificate Google Drive link is there in the chat window. Kindly download it. Thank you, Uttam, sir. Any other participant? Any other participant who has uh, filled the feedback form and not received their certificate as yet? Kindly.